Good evening. It's a real pleasure to welcome all of you here this afternoon. And we want to thank the First Bank for sponsoring this program. And as I said here, well, let me let me change that. Boys and girls, can I have your attention? Okay, thank you. It's a real pleasure to welcome all of you here today. We have an opportunity to hear one of the great uh, historians in Alabama to speak and to uh, Im impress us with all the exciting things that he has seen and acquired and, and done. And today will be no exception. Uh, our presenter, Wayne Flint, has lived and written in Alabama more than any other one historian that I know of. He's had over 6,000 students do the MA and the PhD programs, and he taught uh, for 12 years at Stanford and 28 at Auburn, and he was a visiting scholar at Millsaps College. But uh, the most exciting thing that he has done was the he got the Hugo Black Award and the C. Van Woodward John Hope Franklin Award for the Fellowship of Christian Writers and the Governor of uh, award for arts so he is well versed in whatever subject that he's talking about on the south uh, i finished a book the oh about three or four months ago and i and i left that uh, feeling that this is one of the better books that i've read uh, lately and of course that was one with mary lord brown the tongues of flame and i realized that the last time I felt that way about a book was a Poor But Proud book that Wayne Flint edited, which dealt with uh, the Alabama poor and uh, their a lot in the world between uh, poverty and starvation and what have you. Uh, so today to have Wayne to come talk to us, and I'd like to remind you that he's been a visiting uh, lecturer in Hong Kong. They spent time in China and the Czech Republic and the People uh, Republic of China, as well as the United Kingdom and Austria. So to have him in Sulacaga uh, is something that's really wonderful because he's a native son. When we found out that as a child, he moved around so much, we decided to adopt him back in 1969. So welcome home, Wayne. We're thrilled to have you. Uh, another microphone, right? Uh, can you hear me okay, first of all? Good. Uh, I just love technology. 
uh, I love technology because it is imperative that you have technology. And so I will revise my original statement to say, I love technology that I have to use, but would prefer to use no technology at all. But my Sunday school class has now got to 115. I have to use a microphone. And so I figure if I can persecute the Baptist in Auburn, I can persecute all of you in Sylacauga with a microphone. Uh, for most of us in life, uh, we like to plan what we're going to do. But for part of our lives, usually segments during periods of our lives, planning is just not an option. And so life is about serendipity. Things just happen to you. And I'm not sure, thinking back over my life, whether if I had been able to control everything by planning, I would have been happier than to just let things happen that happened. And one of the problems uh, psychologically trying to understand myself is that I am not by nature a serendipity person. I am meticulous, well-organized, and I worry way too much to just let serendipity control my life. Now, it would be helpful in a situation where I have my kind of personality if I had married somebody who had also a meticulous, methodical approach to life. Uh, but my wife, Darty had exactly the opposite personality from mine. The best example I know of this connects to Ted's introduction about teaching for a semester in China. And when I first received the author offer to go to Hong Kong and teach at Hong Kong Baptist University for a semester, I went home and told Artie, guess what's happened? And um, she said, uh, what? And I said, well, uh, we can go for four months to Hong Kong and uh, live there. They'll pay everything. We live in the new territories and do all these things. And she said, wow, that's really interesting. And I said, yeah, it's kind of terrifying. And I said, there's just so many things that we would have to do. Just think of all the whether you cut off the power to your house and so forth. <clears throat> and Darty's reaction to that was, <clears throat> how much time do I have to pack? That's serendipity. And the friendship with Mary Ward Brown that Darty and I had was just the ultimate example in serendipity. It began like this. I was busy teaching I'm directing graduate students at Auburn University. And uh, one day, my wife came home from uh, listening to a speaker on campus, and she said, I have just met the most fascinating woman I have ever met in my life. And uh, that's a line adequate enough to get your attention as a husband. So I said, well... Uh, who was she? And she said, it was Mary Ward Brown. She is a writer from Hamburg, Alabama, and she was reading short stories, or one of her short stories. She'd been brought to Auburn by the head of the English department, Bert Hitchcock. And Darty said, I have never heard a more wonderful story read by such a traditional woman from the black belt with that distinctive black belt accent. And that was the serendipity that began this story. Now you're gonna see uh, a whole series of slides of Mary Ward in various stages of her life uh, in her home place of Hamburg, Alabama. Uh, that is where she was born. Uh, she was born in uh, 1917, her 
mother and father were owners of large tracts of land which they had purchased. They had moved from Chilton County uh, as poor people to uh, Perry County, one of the richest Black Belt counties in the world. And they had gradually begun to buy of small pieces of farmland until, believe it or not, they owned 3,000 acres spreading from the Cahaba River on the east side of Perry County all the way across the county to the boundary on the west side. They owned the whole central part of Perry County. They were hardworking people. They lived in a little community of Hamburg, and if you've never heard of Hamburg, that is because there is no Hamburg left. And uh, Mary Ward lived in a farmhouse outside Hamburg, or what had once been Hamburg, which to give you some idea of the geography that I'm gonna be talking about today, is about 10 miles south of Marion, which is the county seat, and a very important town, which is gradually, day by day, disappearing. Um, it was the home of Howard College, now Sanford University, which was my alma mater, it was founded there, as were so many of the other uh, universities in Alabama that began in the Black Belt and then gradually moved someplace else. If you think of the University of Alabama on the northern end of the Black Belt, and Auburn University, which was part of Meccan County, which was the northeastern part of the Black Belt. And you think about Judson College, which was the Baptist Women's College, and which was in Marion, Alabama, Perry County. And you think about Birmingham Southern College, which was in Greensville, Greensboro, Alabama, in the Black Belt. Uh, all of a sudden, you begin to think, you know, if you went to college in Alabama in the 19th century, chances are pretty good you lived in the Black Belt because that's where the colleges all were. One up in the north, several in Mobile, and everything else was in the Black Belt. So this was a center of real culture, except that Mary Ward Brown's family was, as I suggested to you, from Chilton County, not well-educated, but very hardworking, shrewd financial managers and land, landed aristocrats by the time she died. Um, when she was a, a baby, her mother was the bookkeeper for the plantation or Hamburg, Alabama, or the country store because if you have lived in those small towns, you know they're sort of the same thing. And her mother was so busy keeping books that she really didn't have time to care for her daughter. And so, as was common for Black Belt families at the time, white Black Belt families, they would bring in an African-American woman to care for the children. And in the case of Mary Ward Brown, it was Joanna Jackson. Uh, Joanna Jackson, and I've, I've been able to find nothing whatever about her except what Mary Ward Brown told me about her. But uh, I do know that there was a kind of special relationship in their life that was so close that Mary, that Joanna Jackson became basically a surrogate mother. Um, this is what Mary Ward Brown wrote about Joanna. If my mother <clears throat> ever sat and held me as a child, I don't remember it. But I do remember the solace of Mammy's lap. Mammy is what she called Joanna Jackson. I'll say more about the term in just a minute. Continuing with what Mary Ward wrote. Though she was small, light-skinned, and far from the stereotype, 
her lap could spread and deepen to accommodate any wound. It smelled of gingham and a smoky cabin, and it rocked gently during my tears. It didn't spill me out with token consolation, but was there as long as it was needed. It was pure heart's ease. It's easy to uh, not understand the last word. H-E-A-R-T-E-A-S-E. -E -E. Does anybody here know the definition of the word heart's ease? Good. Then there's a story in that. Um, when, I, when I first read that line, I did not know that word. I had never heard that word. I had no idea what heart sees means. So uh, one of my first uh, introductions to the work of Mary Ward Brown was going to the dictionary. And the dictionary describes heart sees like this. Peace of mind. Calmness of your emotions. And the third definition I like best of all. It is a wild pansy believed to cure the discomforts of love. A wild pansy capable of healing the discomforts of love. I think about a daughter who is basically just sort of turned over to an African-American to raise in a family where the mother and father are too busy to spend much time with her. And she does not remember much about her mother and father, but she remembers everything about her mammy. And there's something else I want to emphasize at this point in the presentation too, because I'm going to come back to it later. Um, it is difficult to know the ways in which this white woman from this wealthy family who struck out on a course of being a writer tends to mediate race, lives within a, a world in which there are three really important parts of her career. Uh, the first part of it is writing about a specific place, the Black Belt, in such a way that it is not a specific place at all, but it is part of everybody's life you can imagine. No matter what race, no matter what nationality they are, they will recognize what they read in her work because it transcends the parochial world of the black belt. The second thing you need to remember about her is that at the center of her life was race. Not so much so for Silicaga, certainly not so much so for Aniston where I grew up. But the center of the black belt was the relationships of whites and blacks. And that re relationship was not at all what many journalists and historians think. It was extremely complex, extremely complicated. So complicated that a mother and father who are white basically turn over the education and imprinting of a daughter to an African-American woman. And so complicated that to the end of her life, and she died at 97, and to the end of her life, one of her major contributions to world literature was trying to negotiate the way in which black, white, white, black, 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 white, white relationships defined an entire way of life. There was no way you could escape it. No matter what your view of race was, no matter whether you thought they should be able to vote or not vote, you lived in a world where the majority of people were black and the majority of power and money was white. And for Joanna Jackson, 
The real mother figure in Mary Ward Brown's life was an African-American woman. This raises all sorts of interesting questions when you move from the age of apartheid to the age of integration, when suddenly all the power structure in a city like Monroe, or in her case, Marion, suddenly became African-American rather than white. So the whites had had all the power, and then all of a sudden, blacks have all the power, which makes for this very complicated sense of how do you negotiate your way through that world. If you don't understand that, you will not understand anything about her prose or short stories or anything else. But there are terms like mammy, and mammy is not a term you use if you're white referring to an African-American in the 20th, 20th century or the 21st century for that matter. Um, mammy is part of a racial era in which the assumption was that black women raised white children and knew their place within that cultural system. Therefore, Mary Ward had to deal with the term mammy when she was writing about Joanna Jackson. And she said, I knew that it was no longer appropriate for a white writer to refer to an African American as mammy. And she decided that the cultural constraints of modern American prose no longer applied to her and her writing a black the black belt. And she said, Mammy, she was, and Mammy, she will always be. And this is a very important part of the third construction of her life, uh, which is not only the interracial relationships of her prose, but also the fact that she has to take what is the most parochial world, the world of the black belt, and turn this into prose, which is the most universal part of the human experience. In other words, her, her prose is gonna to have to be something about Mammy, but something about the world of black and white interaction in a world where all the old boundaries had been brought down and we have to learn a new way of living with each other, which is obviously one of the most important things I'm gonna say. Curiously, for one of the South's finest writers, her parents were not readers. Can you believe that they had only one book in her house when she was growing up, the Bible? There were no other books. She did not begin to read books until she was basically in high school in Marion, and for the first time was reading something other than the Bible. Um, here again, we see someone who is moving as in race, she's moving outside a white world into a mixed race world. And in terms of her education, she's moving from a world where there's the King James cadence of the Bible to a world in which she's reading all sorts of literature. That continues when she goes to Judson College and she majored in English and journalism. She um, was, what I would call a casual student. And since I have some casual students in the audience today, they will know what I'm talking about. Uh, some call them late bloomers, which is another term I'm gonna use because she's a great model for late bloomers. But uh, casual readers will sometimes not follow a pattern of learning very well, they just pick what they like. And that's what Mary Ward did. She loved English and she loved journalism and she was a casual student and she had learned to smoke. She was very proud of telling me that. She said, Wayne, I want smoke, did you know that? And I said, no, I did not know that. She says, well, I don't smoke now. But she said, I smoked at Judson. And I said, well, you know, it's nice to go to a Baptist Woman's College where you can learn to sin, Mary Ward. It's, a, it's not a, uh, having taught at a Baptist university for for uh, 
12 years, I'm well aware that that's sometimes what happens at such a university. But uh, toward midway through her college career, her mother became terminally ill and she knew her mother was going to die. And at that period, watching her mother die and uh, all that went with that was a sobering kind of experience for her. So she became a very serious student, uh, interested in a much broader set of concerns than sorority sisters and smoking or not smoking. Um, when her mother <clears throat> died, finally, uh, toward the end of her college career at Judson, she uh, <clears throat> had determined that she was going on to graduate school. Uh, she had learned that she loved writing. And she applied to perhaps at that time, the finest graduate program in the United States in English and um, Communications, Northwestern University in Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Uh, <clears throat> she uh, had to provide a writing sample in order to apply to Northwestern. And she wrote a story about Joanna Jackson and Marion, Alabama. And the person at Northwestern who read her essay thought it brilliant, but it was right at the end of the Great Depression and there wasn't much money available. And Mary Ward's uh, concern about putting financial stress on her father and her sisters was such that she decided to turn down the offer to go to Northwestern. I've always wondered how that would have changed her life if she'd had a formal writing program at Northwestern University in her background. Instead, she decided to become publicity director at her alma mater, Judson College. So she uh, turned down this opportunity for a whole new life in a Northern setting. And uh, I'll explain why I think that was such a critical moment in her life later. But certainly she would have been influenced tremendously by what happened at Northwestern and the way the writing instruction went well, she didn't have any writing instruction beyond what she'd had in journalism and English courses at Judson College. Everything else was just her. Uh, the publicity job was a way to make your way as a single woman through the late stages of the Great Depression. And it had one other side effect that was profoundly important in her life. There was a conference in New Orleans of publicity directors from colleges in the South. And she came to Montgomery from Marion to catch a train. And the person who sat next to her on the train was Kurt Lee Brown. Kurt Lee Brown was the publicity director for Auburn University. His father was an administrator at Auburn University. So they were a well-known family in Auburn with significant connections to the administration and the university. And Kirkley thought this girl was really cute. So there was a seat on the train next to her. He sat down and all the way to New Orleans, they talked. When they got to New Orleans, he had been in New Orleans before she had never been. And so he became her guide, carrying her from one place to another to the best restaurants, and all the sites in New Orleans. And on the way back on the train after this three day program on publicity for universities, which morphed into something considerably more than that for the two of them, they talked all the way back to Montgomery where she had to get off the train and go back to Marion. This began a 67 day courtship. And given the quality of the marriage, it just proves that those of us who are parents and tell our kids, uh, you don't know this person well enough to marry them, sometimes you're wrong as a parent because this turned out to be quite a wonderful marriage. Uh, after 67 days from the time they met on the train, they were married in Marion. Uh, they moved to Auburn where he was publicity director and where his father was a significant administrator. 
who owned a house, which some of you familiar with Auburn will recognize immediately, called Noble Hall. Noble Hall is the spectacular antebellum mansion just at the edge of Auburn, going from Auburn out toward uh, Highway 280. So if you take the main road out to the golf course, uh, you'll go right by Noble Hall on your left. It's quite a spectacular mansion even to this day. At the time, there were four bedrooms in the upper floor of Noble Hall. And there were four students who lived in the four bedrooms. And the Browns owned the entire building and lived in the down part, downstairs part of it. <clears throat> However, when, uh, when Kirkley and Mary Warren moved to Auburn, uh, she very quickly became pregnant. And uh, the family thought, well, uh, it would be best if they moved into the upper floor so that they would have that whole floor and the downstairs could be uh, uh, quiet and you wouldn't have to hear a new baby crying all night long. So the upper floor is where Curdley and Mary Ward live with their new baby. And they lived there for just a few months before uh, Mary Ward's father died. Her mother died earlier while she was at Judson. And when her father died, she and her two sisters inherited all of that land from the Cahaba River across the county. Uh, they were faced with a very important question at that point. Do we sell our land, our share of the land to the two sisters or do we move back to Marion? And the decision was to move back to Marion, which proved a difficult decision for Curtly because he had always been a publicity director in a white collar family. He had never worked with blacks. He certainly had never worked with dozens of black sharecropper families. And he had never tried to move an economy from growing cotton on tenant farms to cattle raising, which is what had to be done because of the economics of sharecropping at the time. So they moved back and he's not very good at what he does, but he works really hard at it. And meanwhile, Mary Ward has a baby to raise and she also has something left over from her early childhood about books. She wants to be a writer. She is determined to be a writer. And she begins to write, journal, anything she can think of, short stories, anything. And she's got a baby to raise. She's got a husband and thousands of acres of land to worry about. And she becomes increasingly depressed. Uh, this depression takes numerous forms, but um, those of you who have, have experienced uh, severe depression or have some sense of others who have, know how difficult this can be. And so she winds up, um, Kirkley takes her to New Orleans, to Turo Clinic, and she has a series of shock treatments. And again, if you have been around people who've had depression or have had shock treatments, which is an old fashioned way of treating depression, you probably know the consequences. For instance, pretty much your memory has gone for a while. You don't remember anything for a while. And in her case, she had five different sets of shock treatments trying to get through this period of depression. And uh, from time to time throughout her life, she had problems with depression. But during, uh, by far, this was the worst period for her. So she finds herself in a situation where relatively newly married, a new baby, back in a place uh, where she didn't particularly want to do, be uh, living a life. She didn't want to particularly live. And what she does is therapy is she begins to write. She writes stories. And uh, one after another, she sends the stories off to magazines. And from 1959 until 1966, uh, she sends, I mean, it's basically six, seven years, she's writing stories and every single story is turned down. And for those of you who are familiar with depression, if you 
if you look at the stages of depression, which uh, pretty much run like this, despair, um, hopelessness, then sort of slow recovery, uh, renewal, uh, friendships and normal patterns of life, uh, returning to work, uh, returning to church, finding your religious faith again, a family routine. These are sort of the ways you work yourself out of depression. And that's what she begins to do. But almost immediately, the therapy she chose that was most central to her writing was not successful. So that if this is your way of dealing with depression and you're a failure at it and everybody turns down your work, you can imagine the kind of consequences that are possible. Then all of a sudden, she gets a telephone call. The telephone call, well, I should say that even before the telephone call, uh, she began to have a turnaround in her life around the 1970s. And uh, her agent, for instance, in 1970, called her and said, uh, I have wonderful news. Her agent was in New York City. She, asked, she said, I have wonderful news for you because I've sold one of your stories uh, to McCall's Magazine, which is a very fine women's magazine that did high level of short stories at the time. Uh, the story was called The Amaryllis. And the story of the Amaryllis is about a white physician in the black belt whose wife had died. And for a therapy after the death of his wife, he began to grow Amaryllis. And so the story is about the tragedy of, of losing a loved one, the way in which you try to recover from this, and the way in which you use literature as a way of doing that for her and to grow flowers for the doctor. Uh, the story became quite a hit in McCall's magazine. And that inspired her to believe she could make a life in literature. Uh, by now, uh, her husband is dead. Uh, in the late 1960s, her son, who had been a ROTC student in college, goes to Vietnam and serves for a year in Vietnam during the heaviest fighting. And uh, he told me, I know you're not going to believe this, but he said, my mother wrote me every day that I was in Vietnam. There were 360 some odd letters. I kept them all. And I asked Mary Ward, did you really write him every day? She said, that was my therapy, was writing my son every day. Um, gradually, more and more of her stories were published in really fine journals. Uh, sometimes when I was at Millsaps College, Darty and I would, uh, would live in Jackson, Mississippi for three or four weeks, and then we would drive back home to Auburn, maybe for a football game or something like that. And on the way on Highway 80, it was only eight miles from Highway 80 off the road to where she lived. And so we would stop in to see her. And a fairly typical day went like this. I'm so glad you came because I want you to listen to this story. There's something wrong with it. And she would read the story like I'm going to read to you in just a minute. And she would say, Wayne, something's wrong with this. Or she would say, Darty, you know something's wrong with this. Uh, what's wrong with this? And I would, Darty would have a suggestion to make, but I didn't understand it all. So I just said, I sounds wonderful to me, Mary Ward, just like it is. And she said, no, Wayne, there's something wrong with it. You're not helping me at all. Uh, Darty would come up with some suggestion and, and uh, ultimately it would be changed just by a word or two and would be published and it was brilliant. Um, Mary's words, uh, First book of short stories, uh, Tongues of Flame, which is the story Darty heard when she first read from it uh, at Auburn and came home and told me about this wonderful woman, uh, was very successful. It won the Penn Hemingway Prize, which is a prize for the best piece of American of nonfiction or fiction uh, by a new writer. Uh, it is considered to be sort of the premier first writer's award given in American literature. 
It also won the um, Lillian Smith Prize, uh, which is another very famous literary award. It also won the Alabama Library Association Prize as the best book of the year. And all of a sudden she's on her way. And there is just one story after another. I particularly wanna take a little off ramp here because um, it is also during this period of her life that um, she made a very close friendship with, with a, um, an artist in Selma, Alabama by the name of Gillis, uh, a really wonderful um, watercolorist. And they began to discuss literature, music, um, art. Uh, they go on long walks together. And this is, this is not a romantic friendship. This is just a friendship as part of those ways in which people cope with grief is you find a friend and this friend allows you to sort of come alive again. And Crawford Gillis and, and, and Mary Ward became very close friends. Of course, Selma is very close to Marion. And so they would go back and forth, drive back and forth, and they would talk about literature and music and art. And that was part of her recovery, but it was also part of the inspiration for some of her literature. Uh, she got a call one day uh, from the Friends Quaker Service Commission. Uh, there was a woman there who had been put in charge uh, of a combined program between uh, Russia and America, and this was during the period of Gorbachev and uh, what was called Glasnost. It's uh, a period of, of tearing down barriers after the Cuban Missile Crisis and trying to live together in a world very timely, given what's going on now. And the Friends Service Commission decided that what they would like to do is publish a book that would be combined Russian writers and American writers and that this would be a symbol of this reunion uh, and thawing of the Cold War. Uh, one day, the head of that committee called Mary Ward and introduced herself and said, uh, they talked for a while, and they said, we would like for you to write one of the essays. There are going to be 40 poets and, and short story writers who are going to be asked to write stories for this anthology. And we would like for you to be one of the 40. I might say that the uh, list of people who were invited to uh, write essays for this, pretty impressive. Wendell Berry, Robert Penn Warren, Joyce Carol Oates, John Updike, Alice Walker, Mary, Mary Gordon, Garrison Keeler were among the Americans. So when you get asked to contribute a short story, in the same volume of these other writers, that is perhaps more important than the Lillian Smith Prize in terms of recognition of who you are. But the woman from uh, New York City asked her, uh, I have something really embarrassing because I can't find the answer to this and I don't know uh, how to put this except I don't know if you're black or white. And she had done research on Perry County and her assumption was that she was probably black. My hunch is the reason she was asked to write this essay was because they were pretty sure she was black. And there was no black author, no American black author in this anthology. And I think they wrote, they called her because they wanted her to be black and she wasn't black. And here is the story that was published. I'm not gonna read the whole thing because it's much too long. Beside that, I'm gonna read enough of it, just two pages, where my, my goal is that you're gonna fall in love with Mary Ward and you're gonna go out and you're gonna get tongues of flame or you're gonna get, it wasn't all dancing and you're gonna read her short stories. I might do it on time. Yeah, we got time.
When Ellis Hoag continued to grow worse, her daughters came home. B came first from nearby Valula, then Andretta from Fort Wayne, and Lucindy from Miami. For two days and two nights, they took turns sitting by the bed, waiting for the end. On the third day, Ella began to improve. Consciousness came back first, then gradually alertness. Unbelieving, her daughters gathered around her. Ella looked at them and sighed. I ain't dead yet, she said. Cause she ain't dead, Lucindy scolded. You live as anybody. You done got better. I don't want to get no better, Ella said. If I can't get up and do like everybody else, I don't want to do no better. She lay beneath the quilt she had pieced and quilted years ago in a bed given to her by Doll's grandmother. The bed was a solid dark wood with a high carved headboard and a cracked foot. White women hunting antiques had wanted to buy it or swap her something for it for years. When her daughters arrived, the bedclothes had been dingy and stale as the inside of the trunk where they had kept them. But now the sheets on her bed were aggressively clean. The quilt had been aired in the sun. Ella's old head, tied up in a snowy rag, made the only dent in her pillow. You soon be up, Mama, Lucindy said positively. You coming back that way? How long you been here, Cindy? She asked. She was too weak to move any. I come Tuesday, Lucindy said. Soon as B called up, I told my boss lady, my mama's sick back in Alabama. I got to go. Then I got on the bus. Lucindy was Ella's oldest, born the first year after puberty when Ella was barely 14. Her large frame, heavily fleshed through the hips and bust, was bony elsewhere. Zipped and buttoned into a polyester pantsuit, she looked like a Christmas stocking half filled. Her hair was a vigorous iron gray and her aging face was pleasant. I'm here too, Mama, said Andretta, who had been in Fort Wayne so long she talked like a Yankee. A copper colored replica of Ella at the same age, Andretta leaned down to touch her mother's still unresponsive hand. I see you, Retta, she said, and she smiled. Bee's presence was taken for granted. She was a mixture of her two half-sisters, smaller and lighter in color than Lucinda, larger and darker than Andretta. Lucinda and Andretta were both outside children, but Bee had been born and raised in wedlock. And after Bee, there were no more. No more girls or boys because Ella's husband had mumps that went down on him. What got the matter with me, she wanted to know. Oh, you had a little sinking spell, that was all, Andretta said. You're over it now. I don't know nothing about it. She turned her face toward the open door. She did not even know what month it was. Clusters of yellow berries were on the chinaberry tree, so it had to be fall. Across the road, mock oranges were green and a few lay on the ground. A small fire burned in the fireplace. B began rattling lids on the stove in the kitchen, and soon there were smells of cooking and smoke. But Ella felt no better. She felt nothing at all, except the faint presence of life itself. Has Doll been here, she asked. Every day, Lucindy said proudly. She be back after a while. She don't know you done come too. B pulled up a chair and sat down by the bed with a cup of hot soup. Take a sip of this, Mama, she said, holding out a spoon half full. full. Ella waited and then took a small test, taste. The soup was chicken with soft rice. And when B held out the spoon again, she let herself be fed and kept on sipping until the spoon was scraped bottom. Afterwards, she closed her eyes and rested, listening to the girls tiptoeing around, whispering so as not to disturb her. 
She felt like dozing off. But first, she had to attend to something. What time is she coming? She asked. Who, doll? He said. They had sat down around the fire to eat. Why? Do you want her? I want her. I want her to get Dr. Dobbs to come work on me and get me up from here. All three women turned to look at each other. B swallowed the food in her mouth, feel pea sprinkled with hot pepper sauce and cornbread. Dr. Dobbs been retired, Ella said. I, I don't think he comes at all. He ain't doctored on nobody for three or four years. I think he even kind of mindless now. That's all right, Ella said. I'd rather have Dr. Dobbs mindless than any other doctor. Dr. Dobbs know how to move my bowels and flush out my kidneys and get me back on my feet. He could years ago, Mama, but he can't do nothing now. Your bowels can't move no way because you won't eat nothing. And you ain't eat nothing now. Who made that soup guy gave me? She asked. I did, Mama, said Andretta. Was it good? No, it needed more salt, she said. They looked at each other and smiled. One of y'all go tell Doll I wants to see her, she said in a clear, strong voice, and all the smiles vanished. Go get the doctor. Well, that's just the beginning of the story, but you can understand that the woman from New York City read that story, and she had no idea whether this is a black woman or a white woman writing that story, which is, I would argue, the ultimate tribute to Mary Ward Brown because she was in the culture, but not of the culture. Um, I got about four minutes left or five, and I'm wondering if any of you, having seen what she looked like, um, have any questions, I might say that um, uh, one of the hardest things I ever did was to uh, in my role as a Baptist minister, uh, provide the eulogy for an Episcopalian woman from the Black Belt uh, in St. Wilfred's Church. Um, at 97, when she died, her last request was, I want you to do the eulogy. I said, well, you need your Episcopal priest to do the eulogy, Mary Ward. His feelings are going to be hurt. And she said, I don't care whether they're hurt or not. you got to do the eulogy. So there I am doing the eulogy. Uh, questions? Yes, ma'am. Her husband died uh, of cancer. Uh, he he was diagnosed, and six six uh, months later, he was dead. Uh, and he died in 1970. So, um, to some degree, I think the writing, the solitude of writing, was part of her grief therapy. Um, there's a there's a line when she talks about um, I didn't read it I left that out but there's a line where she um, talks about her her um, initial reaction it's pretty typical of grief especially if you have a serious problem with depression This is from her journal. Uh, at, home at home alone, I cried out loud like a wounded animal. I felt alone not only at home, but in an indifferent moral universe. I mean, as if you've been abandoned by God. And then she drifts into uh, Indian spiritualism, and, and she has a, an Indian holy man in, in uh, Atlanta, and uh, for a while, who advised her, and she's trying to find all these ways to get over grief, which, as you know, is you don't get over grief that way. Generally speaking, you just learn to live with it and find alternatives to it. And uh, she uh, then wrote, um, when she began to write again, she said, now I seem to be at a new stage in my life. I'm alive for whatever reason. 
And I must make something of that. Which is a, a real affirmation of life again. Wouldn't be unlike almost a grief experience for anybody who's in a really happy marriage. Other questions? Well, let me recommend something for your for your uh, reading. Uh, get Tongues of Flame from the best library in Alabama, the Silicaga Library. And uh, I'm sure they've got Tongues of Flame. If they don't have Tongues of Flame, go ahead and have a demonstration outside the library and <laughs> tell them to get with it on Southern Writers. And uh, I think that's her best collection of short stories. But it wasn't all dancing is really good. And it's it's in many ways much superior in terms of just writing skill. But the stories are just so brilliant. Tongues of Flame. Uh, don't miss it. And, I mean, if if you've been looking at that, those uh, shots of her, if, if that's not beautiful, uh, that is actually a manuscript of one of her last... Uh, stories. I was just sitting back there um, listening to Dr. Flint talk, and I think he could stand up here and read the back of a shampoo bottle, and I'd be captivated because he's just so good and. It's just so nice to have somebody know their subject matter well enough that they can just talk about it. And we appreciate you so much for making an effort to come to Sylacauga. It's always a great day when you're here. <laughs> You've got it. <laughs> You've got it. So thank you all so much for coming out today. I do want to mention our sponsor, First Bank of Alabama. Mr. Chris is back there in the back. Thank you, Mr. Chris, for all you all do at the bank and for continuing to sponsor the series for us. Thank you so much to the Hickory Street Cafe at Coosa Valley Medical Center for the cookies that we're all enjoying. It's just so nice to be back. We're glad we found a way to safely do this because seeing you is what we're here for. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to Dr. Shirley Spears in the back of the room back there with the Comer Library Foundation for working hard and getting people the caliber of Dr. Wayne Flint to come to Sylacauga. So thank you so much for that too. Next week, we've got a musical treat for you. We know we always like to have a little music when we can. Next week, we have Tina Marie Hosey. You have seen her before. She's come with the Songwriters Showcase. She's got a beautiful voice. She's going to be singing next week with Patrick Barnett. I don't know how many of you know about Patrick, but he's from Sylacauga. And Patrick is a student at Jacksonville. He's a nursing student there. Um, his mom is Tammy, and his dad is Buddy Barnett. They're a Sylacauga family, and he's got an incredible talent. And um, I've heard him and Tina pair up together before, and they make a great program. So we hope that you'll all come out next week and hear them. Again, thank you so much for being here, and we'll see you next week.